11. Romans chapter 11. No, I haven't forgotten about Romans, have we? Romans chapter number 11. Look with me, if you please, at verses 33 through 36. Do we have uh, announcements this morning? We'll do them right after the sermon, right before offering. Thank you so much. Romans chapter 11, verses 33 through 36. Excited. This will be our last sermon from the first portion of the book of Romans. Verse chapters 1 through 11. Then we'll go to these chapters 12 through 16. That's how the book of Romans is divided up into two sections primarily chapters 1 through 11, and then chapters 12 through 16. Trust that everyone has it. Word of our God reads like this. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and to him and through him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. I'm going to read that one more time just because it feels good to me. For from him that's God. And to or through him, that's God. And to him are all things. To him, to God be glory. No one else. Forever. Amen. I want to preach this morning from the subject, worship the God of Israel. Worship the God of Israel. You may have your seats. Thank you very much. Ushers, you're certainly too kind. Worship the God of Israel. Worship God of Israel. Throughout the 17th century in France, there was a man by the name of Francisco Fenelon. He was the minister of King Louis XIV. King Louis XIV was a devoted, devout, faithful Christian who believed in attending worship service every Sunday. King Louis the 14th was a devout Christian who believed in attending worship service every Sunday as was the custom of the time. King Louis XIV was the last person to enter the sanctuary on Sunday mornings simply because everybody had to stand up and acknowledge that King Louis XIV was in the building. And as was the custom of the time, just before the benediction, just before Minister Francisco Fenelon gave the benediction, it was the custom of the time for King Louis XIV to be the first person to exit 
the sanctuary. All right. He was to be the first person to exit the sanctuary so that everybody could stand up and he could leave so that he could avoid the hustle and the bustle of the crowd. One particular Sunday, King Louis XIV followed his original custom. At the appointed place, at the appointed time, he was the first person to enter the sanctuary. As everybody stood up, as he walked down the aisle, this particular Sunday, just before the benediction was given, as was the custom of the time, everybody stood up to watch King Louis XIV leave the sanctuary. And when King Louis XIV and his entourage were well down the street, Minister Francisco Fenelon, just before he gave the benediction, informed the congregation that King Louis XIV would not be gracing them with his presence the following Sunday. Immediately after, King, after Minister Francisco told the congregation that King Louis XIV would not be gracing them with his presence the following Sunday, he immediately gave the benediction. After the, he gave the benediction, he politely dismissed the congregation. The following Sunday had arrived, and as was his custom, because he was a devout Christian, King Louis XIV at the appointed place, at the appointed time, arrived at the sanctuary. Okay. But to his surprise, there was absolutely nobody there but King Louis XIV, his entourage, and Minister Francisco. Okay. Outraged that him and his entourage and only Minister Francisco were the only people at worship service that Sunday. King Louis XIV demanded to know what does this mean? In which Minister Francisco calmly explained to King Louis that last Sunday he had informed the congregation that the king would not be gracing us with his presence. Curious to know why Minister Francisco would tell the congregation that he would not be attending worship service. Minister Francisco calmly explained, because you see, you king, I wanted to know how many people come to this place to worship God, right. or how many people come to this place to flatter the king? All right, all right. <laughs> so, so I told the people that you were not going to be here to see if they would show up because God was going to be here. But they decided not to come to worship because they don't come to this place to worship, they come to flatter the king. All right. Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, I have come to realize that in a one of the inevitable realities of the 21st century church is that there are more and more people who come to worship to flatter the king as opposed to worshiping God. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, there are many people who come to this place. And if they know that their preacher is not going to be standing in the pulpit, they'll come, but they don't have an amen to give. But they'll come to this place and they'll listen to the choir sing. But if the choir doesn't sing their song the right way at the right time, they don't have a hand to clap for choir. They come to flatter the king, but not to worship God. I want to know, is there anybody in this place who came here 
here this morning to give God the praise that he so rightfully deserves. I don't care who preaching, don't care who singing, don't care who passing out envelopes. I didn't come to see you. I came. is 
an attribute of God. All right. When you speak about wisdom in relation to man, wisdom is used as a characteristic of man. But when you speak about wisdom in relation to God, wisdom is not a characteristic of God. It is an attribute of God. Right. The difference therein, ladies and gentlemen, is this. When you speak about a person's character, a character can change. But an attribute is just who that person is. So when you speak about wisdom in relation to God, you are not speaking about something that can change. You are speaking about who God is. I don't think I got that over to you. Wisdom refers simply to the execution of the plan. It comes from the Greek word sophie. You just learned something, didn't you? Come on. Amen. When you see somebody named Sophia, you can say, I know what your name means in Greek, can't you? Wisdom comes from the Greek word Sophia. It refers to how a person applies their knowledge. It refers to how a person carries out their plan. But the definition of wisdom means little to nothing here as much as the grammatical features surrounding the text. Wisdom in the text is a noun. You've been in the English class, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Noun refers to a person, place, or thing. Here, a noun refers to a person. That person is God. It is a noun used in what is called the genitive case. A noun used in the genitive case can do one of two things. A noun used in the genitive case can either describe something about something, a oh, noun in the genitive case can be used to show what something has possession of. Here, the argument is for the latter. Wisdom is a possession of God. Wisdom belongs to God. Thought I'd have a witness there? Glad I brought my own. James chapter number one, somewhere around verse number five, James says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Why would I ask God for wisdom? Because God is the one who possesses wisdom. Watch this. If God is the one who possesses wisdom, and you need to ask God for wisdom, what makes you think that God needs your help being God? If you got to ask God for everything you need, what makes you think that God needs your two cents to get what he wants done? God doesn't have to use you, but you ought to be glad that he does. You ought to worship the God of Israel because he does not need any help being God. God executes his plan of salvation with his wisdom, but God formulates his plan with his knowledge. Paul says not only is God rich in wisdom, it's right there in verse 33, but he is also rich in knowledge. Knowledge refers to complete knowledge. There is nothing that God does not know.
And because God knows the beginning from the end, and the end from the beginning, he don't need you. Neither does he need me to execute his plan. Come on now. But what makes us worship the God of Israel is that he was gracious enough to not only include us, but to use us. Yes. That's what motivates us to worship when we really understand that God could have chose anybody to do what he wanted to do, but he saw something, whatever it was, in me to use me. Thank you, Lord. Paul says, God is rich in wisdom. He's rich in knowledge. But just when you think Paul is finished, he takes it a step further in the B portion of verse 33, and he says, how unsearchable are the judgments of God. The word unsearchable here is, comes from a compound Greek word. Simply used as a forensic term. You know what a forensic term is? You watch CSI. It's fingerprints to footprints, hair samples, you know. Paul says, the judgments of God are uncertain. In other words, when you're trying to figure out what God is doing, you can't find a clue that God has been here. <laughs> When you're looking for God's footprint, there's no sign of it. Paul digs deeper by using the word judgment. Judgment refers to God's decision-making process. It refers to how God makes decisions, or it simply refers to how God thinks. We are guilty of trying to figure out how God thinks. We are guilty of telling people this is happening to you because God didn't like when you did this. Uh, all right. And this is happening to me because I do this. Uh, yeah. God's been gracious to me because this, that, and the other. That's completely out of order with Scripture. Paul says, God's judgments are unsearchable. Uh -huh. In other words, I don't know why God decided to do this. Uh -huh. I just can't figure out what God is doing. Because God's wisdom and his knowledge is so much over ours that we cannot fathom how God is doing it. Paul presses his point by quoting Isaiah chapter 41, verse number 13, when he says, For who has known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Take a look at Isaiah chapter 40 when you get home, and you'll find the context of that statement. The context of the statement is simply King Hezekiah is the king at the time. King Hezekiah allows the Babylonians to come in and search out all his treasure places. And after the Babylonians leave, Isaiah goes to King Hezekiah and he says, what do them Babylonians want? And he said, oh, they just wanted to take a look at my treasure. And Isaiah told King Hezekiah that the Babylonians, he prophesied to them that the Babylonians would come and they would take all of his treasure. And they would lead him into captivity. And they would lead his sons into captivity. But in, in Isaiah chapter 41, Isaiah says, don't worry about going into captivity. Because the same God that formulated a plan to put you in captivity is the same God that is going to formulate a plan to bring you out of captivity. The natural question is this. How is God going to do it? Isaiah answers, 
God is not the President of the United States who needs the agreement of the Senate to do what he wants to do. God does not need any help being who he is. There's nobody above him to impeach him. There's nobody beneath him to vote him in. There's nobody on his right or his left. He's God all by himself. And that's simply why you should worship the God of Israel, because he's God all by himself. Lisa, hold you too long. Not only must you worship the God of Israel because he's God all by himself, but you should worship the God of Israel because the God of Israel is worthy of worship. You should worship the God of Israel because the God of Israel is worthy of worship. Verse 36 is broken down essentially into two parts. The A portion of verse 36, Paul says, for from him and through him and to him are all things. Paul here explains why it is the, cre the, the creator and the giver of everything is worthy of worship. Notice my speech here. I did not say that the God of Israel is worthy of your worship. All right. I said the God of Israel is worthy of worship. Notice I didn't say that the God of Israel is worthy of my worship. I didn't say that. I said that the God of Israel is worthy of worship. Let me tell you what I'm talking about because it looks like I'm boring you. Whether you worship God or not has no bearing on whether he's worthy of worship. <laughs> so you can come to the house of the Lord and you can sit the whole service with your hands folded. Does not mean that God is any less of me God. Thought I ever witnessed that glad I go on. <laughs> Luke chapter 19, somewhere around verse number 40. You know the story. Jesus is entering Jerusalem on a donkey or a colt. Uh -huh. And the crowd is yelling, Hosanna! Hosanna! To the highest. But there were some Pharisees in the crowd who approached Jesus and told Jesus to tell these people to shut up. Do you know what Jesus said? Jesus said, uh, Luke chapter 19, verse 40, Jesus said, I can tell them to be quiet. But if I tell them to be quiet, guess what will happen? The rocks will start saying, Hosanna. In other words, ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to give God praise, but if you don't give him praise, there's somebody that will give him praise. But if you got good sense, if you got real good sense, when you come to the house of the Lord, you ought to give the Lord praise. I don't care who you're mad at. When you come to the house of the Lord, you want to give the Lord some praise. I don't care what's going on in your life. When you come to the house of the Lord, you want to give the Lord some praise. You want to worship him because he's worthy to be praised. For from God, through God,
To get what you desire from God does not start with asking him for it. Did you hear that? Oh, that it. To get what you desire from God does not start with asking him for it. To get what you want from God does not start with you asking him for it. All right. It starts with you worshiping him. All right. All right. You ever try to get what you want from your mother and did nothing she told you to do? What makes you think that God is in the other way? You don't go to God and don't care nothing about worshiping him, but think you go get something out of him. Don't work that way. Paul says everything comes from God, but it starts with worship.
So Joseph formulated a plan that in the seven years of plenty, how to store crops that they would not starve to death during the seven years of famine. Bible informs us that the famine did not only affect Egypt, but it also affected all the lands, which simply means it was a famine over all the earth that caused people from all over the world to go down to Egypt to get some food. All right. Jacob told his sons that had sold Joseph into slavery to go down and get some food from Egypt. And when the brothers went to Egypt, guess what the Bible says they did? They fell down on their face, yes. which was a form of worship. Uh -huh. They fell down on their face because Joseph had what they needed. Come here, let me talk to you for a minute. If you want what you need from somebody who has what you need, you have to start with worship. Because he's worthy yeah. of worship. Yeah. You don't get what you want from God by, by starting by asking for it. Yeah. You get it by starting with worship. Yeah. I'm in my seat. All I've been trying to tell you in this short time we've spent together uh -huh. is that you should worship the God of Israel. Because the God of Israel is God all by himself. Not only should you worship the God of Israel because he is God all by himself, but you should worship the God of Israel because the God of Israel is worthy of worship. Yeah, yeah. Go out the book of Romans, chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and now finally at the end of chapter number 11. Paul has been trying to tell us two things. First, the God of Israel is the one through his infinite knowledge that formulated the plan of salvation. Uh -huh. Not only was the God of Israel the one through his infinite knowledge, the one who formulated the plan of salvation, but God through his infinite wisdom was the one who executed his plan of salvation to send the Lord Jesus Christ to be born of a virgin, yeah, to yeah. walk to see shores of Jerusalem, make blind men see, lame men walk, and dead men live. He formulated his plan right. through the wisdom, his infinite wisdom, to hang his only begotten son on a cross between two thieves. Through his wisdom, he buried his son. Through his wisdom, he gave his son new life and resurrected his son. And his son now sits on his right hand side. Paul says you ought to praise the God. Because although you might not be able to explain how God did, although you might not be able to trace out how God brought it to pass, you ought to worship him because he's infinitely knowledgeable okay. and he's infinitely wise. Yes. And through his infinite wisdom and his infinite knowledge, you and I are recipients.